Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we celebrate the fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. And in our worship this morning, as you'll see in our readings, sometimes very vividly, uh, we're going to be focusing on the fact that God has called us to be light to this world, uh, to share and preach his word. And the important part of that that we're really going to focus on is the fact that our God equips us to do that. He equips us. He, he gives us gifts. He sends us forth to preach his word. And as I said, you're going to see that per portrayed very vividly in the portions of scripture we're going to look at today. We'll be following the order of service printed for you in your bulletin. And our opening hymn is hymn 483. May the Spirit of God richly bless your worship this morning. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin 
and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Gracious Lord, you call and appoint us to proclaim the good news of your Son. Purify us by your grace, remove our uncertainties, and work through us to fill the nets of your kingdom with those lost in the darkness of death. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is taken from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And this portion of scripture is one of the most vividly powerful in the entire Bible. Isaiah, at the start of his ministry, he sees the Lord. He sees the Lord sitting on a throne. If you ask the question, what happens to sinners when they meet the perfect God, the answer is, they die. And when Isaiah saw the Lord within a nanosecond, there was something intrinsic about how the perfect God looked that Isaiah immediately thought, I'm going to die. I am a dead man. And yet God forgave him, restored him, and it was in the joy of this forgiveness that Isaiah went forth to proclaim God's word. From Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of our God. We're now joined together to sing Psalm 67. We're going to be using a setting of Psalm 67 that is taken from the new Psalter, which is a companion of our new hymn. <laughs>
Our second lesson this morning is taken from Romans chapter 10, verses 12 to 17. Again, what happens when sinners run into the perfect God? They die. And we're in a world that is dying in sin and death and all of the destruction that sin brings. And yet there is one thing that brings life, the gospel of our Lord, the message of Jesus Christ. It's through that message that the Holy Spirit does the impossible. He creates faith. He changes hearts. And we hear the encouragement here from Paul. Faith comes from hearing this message, the message of Christ. From Romans 10. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news! But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel lesson today is taken from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. It's the account of the miraculous catch of fish. And notice that what happened to Isaiah, the same thing happens to Peter. Jesus reveals his glory as the one true God, and Peter immediately breaks down. Away from me, Lord, I am a sinner. And yet Jesus restores him, forgives him, and equips him, and then calls him, sends him forth to preach the word. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We join in the hymn of the day, hymn 745.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance, dear friends, from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I am fairly certain, in fact, I'm very certain, that first century Galilean fishermen did not take diamonds and rubies and pearls or other precious stones and sew them into their fishing nets and then throw the fishing nets into the water. I'm pretty sure they just used good nets. And please take that thought and set it aside for right now. Dear friends, according to the latest statistics from the United States Department of Labor, and how exciting that sentence sounds, <laughs> over two-thirds of people who currently work remotely hold down two jobs, which is kind of high. Over two-thirds of people who work remotely, work from home, are actually holding down two jobs right now. And again, that's just the people working remotely. According to the numbers in the past decade, the number of Americans who work two jobs has risen dramatically. And there's various reasons for this. I mean, the cost of living has gone up. Our economy isn't quite what it used to be. But the amount of people who are forced to work two jobs just to make ends meet has skyrocketed in our country. In fact, I'm willing to bet I'm pro there's probably several here today who work two jobs. And working two jobs, that, that can lead to some bad days, some bad nights. And you don't need a talking crystal ball like me to tell you that. That just, it can lead to some bad days and bad nights. It's more work, more stress. It takes up more of your time, which automatically means you have less time for relax relaxation. Holding down two jobs can lead to some bad nights. And dear friends, as you noticed in our text for today from the gospel lesson, Peter had a bad night. Granted, he wasn't working two jobs, at least not that we know of, but the job he did have was not going well. He had a bad night, and I mean that professionally. They had caught nothing. And it was at this point that our compassionate Savior steps in and he gives to Peter, James, and John, these exhausted fishermen, an incredible gift. He gives them the miraculous catch of fish. But Jesus has something to teach us with that. He, wasn't, he didn't just do that for Peter, James, and John. I know that it looks like that. Of all the miracles of Jesus, the one we're looking at today, is, it seems to have a pretty narrow focus, doesn't it? He gives fish to fishermen. That doesn't really apply to us. And yet the truth is, when you look at this miracle, Jesus has something he wants to teach us this morning. Because whether you know it or not, you are holding down two jobs. And that makes for a beautiful life. Now, at the risk of being repetitive... I just want to make sure everybody realizes I'm pretty certain that first century Galilean fishermen did not take diamonds and rubies and pearls and sew them into their nets and then throw those nets into the water. I'm pretty sure they weren't doing that. They just used good nets. Okay? Now, our text for this morning, it's our gospel lesson, and Peter lets you know in verse 6 that it's not been going well. He says to Jesus, we have worked all night and caught nothing. And brothers and sisters, I think we sometimes, I think we need to realize just how bad a mood Peter was really in and how rough this was on him. You got to remember, Galilean fishermen, they did not work uh, for hourly rates. They didn't make an annual salary. 
The amount of money that they brought in, the amount of money that they had to take care of their family was directly proportionate to the amount of fish they caught. And they had just spent hours overnight not sleeping. And all that effort and all that time was wasted. They caught nothing. You know, I suspect, the text doesn't say this, but I do wonder if after that all-night fishing expedition that turned up nothing, Peter, James, and John stuck around to listen to Jesus talk to the crowds that morning just because they didn't want to have to go home and tell their families, I didn't make anything. And brothers and sisters, again, it's at this point that the compassionate Savior steps forth and he gives a gift that was uniquely fit for Peter and James and John. He gives them this miraculous catch of fish. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that this was the biggest financial windfall Peter had ever experienced in his, his career. Like from a business standpoint, nothing like this had ever happened. This was more fish than he probably thought he was ever going to catch. This was huge. Because of what Jesus did, Peter was going to make more money in one day than he ever had before. I mean, the text actually says there was so much fish that it brought two boats to sinking. And these are not like little canoes. They're pretty good-sized boats. The biggest financial gift Peter had ever gotten. Because Jesus gave them this gift of the miraculous catch of fish, this financial gift. Or did he? Is that what Jesus was giving them? Brothers and sisters in Christ, I would ask you this morning to take a moment and really think about why Jesus did this miracle. Why did he do this? I mean, for most of the miracles of Jesus that we read about in Scripture, we know why he does them. Like, the point is usually pretty obvious. In fact, sometimes Jesus himself will tell you why he's doing something. For instance, why did Jesus perform the miracle of raising Jairus' daughter? Well, because Jairus asked him to, and Jesus had compassion on that little girl, so he brought her back to life. Or why did Jesus feed the 5,000? Well, he actually tells us in the text these people have been listening to me for days. They're putting the word of God first, and they haven't eaten. Some of them have come from a long way. I don't want them to get in trouble on the way home. I want to feed them. For most of the miracles of Jesus, the point is pretty obvious. Sometimes even Jesus will tell you why he's doing something. Why does he do this? Why does he give the miraculous catch of fish? Is it because he wanted to show his divine power as creator who rules over not only the wind and the waves, but fish too? He wanted to show the crowds that he had been teaching all morning his power? No. If you look closely at our text, Jesus tells Peter to go to the deep part of the lake. Go out into the middle of the lake. He leaves the shore. He leaves all those people. This miracle was only done in front of a few people. There were not many eyewitnesses to this. Well, as I kind of hinted at before, did Jesus do this miracle because he wanted to give Peter, James, and John, these exhausted fishermen, a gift? A financial gift. They'd worked hard and they'd got nothing. Did Jesus just want to give them a little something? Just kind of help them out? No. You know how we know that? Look at the last verse in our text. What do Peter, James, and John do when they get back to the shore? They leave everything. You, you realize what that means? They never cashed in the fish. They caught all these fish and then left them. They never cashed them in. They never sold them. They left all of their stuff. They left their career, everything, as soon as they got back to shore. Peter did not use the gift Jesus gave him, the fish, at all. He left them in the boat and then followed Jesus. 
So why did Jesus do this for them? Well, brothers and sisters, in our verses, Jesus is calling Peter, James, and John to follow him. And at the same time, he's calling them into the public ministry of the gospel. They will become his apostles. Later in their lives, they're going to go forth into the world and preach the word. That's what makes this portion of scripture so important. That's why this miracle is important. What Jesus is doing with this miracle is he's showing Peter this is what preaching the gospel is like. This is what it's like when you live a life preaching my word. That's what Jesus is doing. Look closely at the miracle. You'll see what I mean. When Jesus asked Peter to go to the deep part, what did Peter have to do? In other words, in the miracle in our text, what role did Peter play? He dropped the net, right? That's what he did. He cast the net into the water. After that, he did nothing. That's all he did. That's all Peter was responsible for in the miracle. He did not direct the course of the fish into the net. He did not sow little diamonds and rubies onto the net so that the fish went, ooh, and swam towards it. Peter did not choose which fish were going to be caught that morning and which would stay in the lake. Jesus was responsible for all of that. In the miracle, all Peter does is cast forth the net. He is responsible for nothing else. It is Jesus doing it all. And brothers and sisters, this is exactly what living a life preaching the gospel is like. It's the same thing. All you and I do is cast the net. That's it. That's all we're responsible for. You are not responsible for creating faith in someone's heart any more than Peter was responsible for telling all those fish to go into his net. All we do is cast the net of the gospel out into the world and then Jesus does the rest. And we dare not try and sow diamonds and rubies into the net of the gospel because we think it'll make it work better. And sometimes we do fall to that temptation, unfortunately. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be fair, Jesus this morning has not told you to quit your job and devote yourself full-time to preaching the gospel. That's what he did with Peter, James, and John. He has not done that with you. However, you are God's children, and that means that God has called you to be a light to this world. God has called you to go forth and spread the net of the gospel, cast forth the net of his word at the opportunities he gives you. That's what I meant earlier when I said you are holding down two jobs, whether you know it or not. You have your earthly job, which is important, whatever it may be, but you also have your calling from your heavenly Father to cast forth the net of the gospel. But if you're like me, and what I mean by that is if you're as selfish as me, you end up putting most of your time and effort into your earthly job while forgetting it your spiritual calling. And I say that as a pastor, supposedly the holiest job. It's not, by the way. It's not any holier than anything else. It's just that I end up focusing my attention on my earthly job, and all too often I view it as the way to get my paycheck. But when it comes to my spiritual calling, suddenly I become lazy. Well, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will cast the net. The other the temptation that we often fall into, even when we do cast the net of the gospel, when we do preach our Father's word, is we foolishly make ourselves responsible for things that we are not responsible for. In the miracle of, the, of catching all those fish, Peter was responsible for casting the net. That's it. He didn't do anything else. He didn't direct the course of the fish. He didn't choose which fish came. None of it. All he did was cast the net. And when you and I preach the gospel, all we are asked to do is cast forth the net. You are not responsible for trying to make people like Jesus. You are not responsible for trying to make people like Christianity more. 
You are not responsible for figuring out why some people come and some don't, any more than Peter was responsible for trying to figure out why some fish came into his net that morning and some stayed in the lake. You are not responsible for any of these things. You are asked to cast the net. And along with that, sometimes the final temptation that we run into is we try and sow diamonds and rubies in pearls into the net of the gospel because we think it makes it work better. Like if we surround the message of Jesus with enough enough pretty things, well, it'll be prettier. And people will want to be around it more. Or if we surround the gospel with enough comfortable things, people will want to stay by it longer. But that is not true. We sometimes fall into the the, the if we just mindset, if we just have a better looking building or a greater church or all of that, or if we just have a better worship style or more electrifying or more engaging, or if we can just get a better group, like a better fellowship here with a better like way we do our groups so then people want to stay longer. And don't get me wrong, those are great things that we should be doing but they are not the net. And if you and I do those things under the mistaken impression that somehow we're making the net of the gospel stronger, we are doing it wrong. We dare not try and sow diamonds into the net of the gospel because we think it makes it work better. That is blasphemy. It is already the power of God. And dear friends, that is to your comfort every day. The joy and the comfort that you have, that yeah, you do live a life where you hold down two jobs. You have your earthly calling, which is important, but your Father in heaven has also called you to go forth and spread the net of the gospel. Just cast it out. And that's it. That's it. And you have the comfort of knowing that when you cast forth the net, Jesus is the one standing behind you. Just like he stood behind Peter in the boat and he directed the course of the fish. Peter just sat there after he let the net into the water. Jesus did the rest. And he stands behind us. He's the one who truly holds the net. He is the one who is active through his spirit, through the message of the gospel. Jesus, the compassionate Savior, who allowed himself to be butchered on a cross so that you could be perfect. Your compassionate Savior, who allowed himself to drown in the sea of your sins, so that you could sit in the safety of his righteousness. And in your baptism, Jesus cast his net over you. And he brought you to himself. And every day through the gospel, he affirms to you his most basic promise, that you belong to me. Nothing will separate you from me, not your sins. They can't separate you from me. And it is that Jesus that every day, through clay jars like us, throughout the world, every day, he casts forth the net of the gospel and he claims unbelievers. He turns them into his children and he reaffirms to them the same promise that he reaffirms to you every day. You belong to me now. Nothing can separate you from me. This is the joy of holding down two jobs that you and I currently live in. That all we do is cast forth the net of the gospel and Jesus takes care of the rest. Just like at the miraculous catch of fish. Brothers and sisters, the final thing I would say this morning, because as you know, after this service, we're going to have a merger presentation. And I have to be honest with you, when I was preparing the sermon this morning, I thought that, Lord, this is very timely. And when we discuss these things, I know it's been a while since we've done it. I would humbly ask you, as you think about these things, as you you make decisions on it, Don't do it 
with the outlook of thinking that you're sowing diamonds into the net of the gospel. Don't do it thinking, well, the good thing about a merger will be if we get a better building or a bigger building or, or this or that. It's not about that. Yeah, we're going to try and do those things, but it's not about that. I would humbly ask you to think of it as if we merge, will we be able to cast the net more? Will we cast the net farther? I don't know. Whatever may or may not happen, I know this. All of us have the joy of holding down two jobs. We cast the net of the gospel forth, and then we watch Jesus do. We watch him do the rest. That is a beautiful life. Amen. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in true faith through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. When I'll join to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. O Lord, the stories of your compassion are endless. May we always look to your mercy and be moved to give you offerings that reflect our confidence in your promises. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we will include a prayer for a young woman named Ife, who is a senior at Wisconsin Lutheran High School. Last night uh, at Wisco's dance, she experienced a medical emergency. Lord and Savior, you have purchased us to be your own for all eternity. You have given purpose to our time in this life by making us your witnesses to lost sinners. We thank you for this privilege. As you looked with compassion on the lost sheep of Israel, grant that your Holy Spirit may move us to look with compassion on the lost of our day. Fill us with zeal to do, to do all that we can to bring them the precious gospel. Lord, we thank you for missionaries and their families who are willing to live and work in distant lands. Keep them from harm of body and soul and give them joy in their difficult assignments. Above all, we ask you to bring those who hear the word to repentance and faith. Look with compassion on all people, especially those who are suffering. Give help and relief to all who are in need. And compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence we commit all who are sick or suffering to your care. We pray especially for Ife, provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance to her if her suffering must linger, and help her find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Lord, renew us, restore us, 
and use us to proclaim your love by word and deed to all people. May many more rejoice with us and we with them when together we stand before your throne of glory. We ask this all in your most holy name. Amen. And in that name we join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. Please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, two announcements that I'd like to highlight. First off, as you heard, uh, the merger presentation will be after this service. It will take place up here in the church. Food will also be served downstairs in the fellowship hall. And I think in general, it'll get started around 1145. And then the other thing that I would like to highlight, uh, this past week, Mrs. Catherine uh, Felgenhauer, who we called to be our first and second grade teacher, returned our call. So on Wednesday at 6.30 this week, we are going to have a call meeting for a first and second grade teacher. So again, I'll, I'm highlighting that because uh, that'll be a midweek call meeting. So Wednesday at 6.30, uh, please try and be there. And with that, may God richly bless your week.